Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, which is focused on the cryo FMR option for the PPMS product line. This is a somewhat unique option for us at Quantum Design. While the measurement probe, shown to the right, is based off of a modified Quantum Design multifunction probe, the measurement electronics and software are provided by Nanosk, a company we represent and distribute for worldwide. The cryo FMR option allows the experimenter the ability to probe the broadband ferromagnetic resonance or FMR properties of their samples, potentially spanning 2 to 40 gigahertz and at magnetic fields and temperatures offered by their base PPMS system. This webinar will cover the motivation and basic theory behind a broadband FMR measurement, installing the cryo FMR option hardware, the software and subsequent data analysis, Several extensions to our broadband FMR capabilities will also be discussed, including how to measure the exchange stiffness, how to measure the inverse spin hall effect, and finally I will briefly discuss other measurement platforms in which broadband FMR can be performed using the electronics provided by Nanosk. Starting with some motivation and basic measurement theory. In order to motivate the utility of a broadband FMR measurement, I will use measurement frequency to demonstrate how FMR fits within the magnetic measurement capabilities offered by Quantum Design. We will discuss our measurement capabilities as a function of increasing frequency. Starting at the DC limit, we have our vibrating sample magnetometer, or VSM option. Here we are only interested in the length of the magnetic moment vector as a function of static DC magnetic field and or temperature. The VSM is discussed at length in the VSM option webinar, which can be found on our YouTube channel. As the excitation magnetic field frequency increases, we enter the realm of what is typically referred to as an AC susceptibility measurement. In an AC susceptibility measurement, we are interested in how the magnetic moment vector responds to an AC field. For example, the ACMS2 PPMS option operates up to 10 kHz and is discussed at length in our ACMS2 webinar, also found on YouTube. AC susceptibility measurements have found great utility in the study of spin glasses, superparamagnetic nanoparticles, and of course superconductors. Note, while not offered for the PPMS product line, AC susceptibility measurements can be performed well into the megahertz range. As the excitation frequency increases into the gigahertz realm, we are now probing dynamics at nanosecond timescales which are set by the gyromagnetic ratio and can be theoretically modeled by the Landau-Lifshitz-Gilbert equation, which will be discussed a bit later. Here the coherent processional dynamics of ferromagnets and even antiferromagnets can be studied. These frequencies also correspond to those associated with the generation of spin waves or magnons. Increasing the excitation even farther into the terahertz realm, the so-called ultra-fast dynamics are studied, which allow one to probe the exchange interactions fundamental to both antiferromagnets and ferromagnets. Typically, such excitation fields must be provided by pulse laser sources, and therefore optical access to the sample is typically required, for example, as offered by Optical, our 7-Tesla magneto-optical cryostat. Focusing back on ferromagnetic resonance, the gigahertz dynamics probed by FMR allow the experimenter to extract several material parameters not accessible by either VSM or ACMS2 measurement options. These include the effective magnetization, gyromagnetic ratio, damping parameter, inhomogeneous broadening, and while not directly extracted from the software, the cryo FMR option allows one to also measure the exchange stiffness and inverse spin hall effect. Broadband FMR is primarily of interest to those researchers studying thin magnetic films, whether they be metallic or insulating. I will discuss more about this later, but the excitation fields generated by the coplanar waveguides necessary for a broadband excitation are relatively short range, and therefore best suited for thin films. More specifically, research on magnetic recording media is always of high interest. Not only is this true for traditional perpendicular recording media, but also for studies on future heat-assisted and especially microwave-assisted magnetic recording media. While a recorded magnetic bit is intrinsically static, the process of recording that information quickly is intrinsically dynamic and occurs at nanosecond timescales, and is also true for magnetic random access memory devices. Therefore, an understanding of the gigahertz dynamics of such materials is paramount. And finally, Materials utilized for more fundamental research areas focused on functionalizing spin waves, termed magnonics, 
naturally benefits from a knowledge of the aforementioned dynamic properties. It is now time to discuss some of the basic theory behind an fMR measurement. I will start with a magnetic moment vector, m, in a static DC field, shown in blue and denoted H effective. At equilibrium, the magnetic moment will align with the external field, as expected. If we apply a small perpendicular perturbing field, shown in green, the moment vector will cant away from H effective. If this perpendicular field is then removed, the magnetic moment vector will then process around H effective, and the dynamics can be described by this differential equation, which is very similar to that of a precessing top many of us learned about in our classical mechanics courses. In the absence of a dissipative influence, the magnetic moment vector would, in theory, process indefinitely around H effective. However, there will always be some form of damping, which will cause the magnetic moment vector to spiral inward towards H effective. The magnitude of this dissipative contribution is quantified by the phenomenological damping parameter alpha. The complete differential equation is known as the Landau-Lifshitz-Gilbert equation. While pulse field measurements, as I just described, have been performed in the literature, most measurements are performed using a continuous RF excitation field. Traditionally, this type of excitation has been carried out and accomplished by a resonant cavity, which is basically just a metallic box. Here is an example of a cylindrical cavity in cross-section. The microwave, or RF field, shown in green, will have a given spatial profile that allows one to place a sample such that the RF and DC magnetic fields are along a desired direction. These cavities can be tuned to have very high quality, or Q factors, and can provide relatively uniform and long-range excitation fields. The primary downside to a resonant cavity is the simple fact that they operate at a single fixed frequency. Over the past 10 to 15 years, the use of coplanar waveguides have become more prevalent in fMR measurements, particularly of thin films. Here I show the coplanar waveguide used for in-plane cryo-fMR measurements. If we take a look at this in cross-section, we find that the RF magnetic fields are primarily generated near the central conductor. Coplanar waveguides allow for a broadband excitation of the sample. However, the excitation fields are not as uniform as they are for cavities and are strongest very near the surface of the coplanar waveguide. This technique is therefore best suited for thin films, and by thin we generally mean less than 100 nanometers. Let us now build up a cryo-FMR measurement system from the ground up. Here's a schematic coplanar waveguide along with an RF current source and an RF detector, which is essentially an RF diode. Our measurements are performed by analyzing transmission through the coplanar waveguide. The incident microwave current is converted to a DC voltage by the detector. The magnitude of this DC voltage is directly proportional to the transmitted microwave power. Ideally, the sample should be placed here, as also shown in this picture. The RF field will be oriented horizontally, which is important as the DC magnetic field provided by the superconducting solenoid and the PPMS is vertical. Remember, in order to resonantly excite the magnetic moment, the RF field must be perpendicular to the DC field. For our purposes here, the RF frequency will remain fixed and the DC magnetic field is swept. At a particular combination of DC field and RF frequency, the sample magnetic moment will processionally resonate. During resonance, the sample will therefore absorb some of the RF power, which will therefore not make its way to the RF diode, resulting in a dip in the transmitted power. For those of you familiar with the vector network analyzer, this is analogous to an S21 measurement and is essentially just the DC voltage on the RF diode in our example. As the energy absorbed by the sample is small, so is the corresponding change in voltage. In order to improve the signal to noise, an additional modulation field is supplied by a Helmholtz coil, as shown here. And the voltage measurement is performed by a lock-in amplifier. The modulation field is on the order of 1 to 10 ersted and, when compared to the resonant frequencies of the sample, is very slow, typically 490 Hz. In such a field modulated experiment, it is actually the derivative of the absorption response that is measured, as shown in blue. The RF source, RF detector, modulation drive, and lock-in amplifier are all included within the spectrometers offered by NANOSC. Here's an example spectrum measured at a fixed frequency of 6 GHz of a 2 nanometer thick cobalt iron boron film. 
The red line is a fit using this equation. For more details regarding this fit equation, you can refer to this dissertation. The resonant field and line width are then extracted from this fit and used for subsequent analysis. Note the amplitude of the resonant spectra is not used in our analysis. The black squares are the measured resonance field, measured up to 40 gigahertz of the 10 nanometer thick permaloid test sample that is included with the cryo fMR option. The red line is a fit to the Kittel equation, from which the effective magnetization and gyromagnetic ratio can be determined. Note, for this sample, any in plane anisotropy component is so small that the effective magnetization is essentially the saturation magnetization. Another important thing to note is that the intrinsic quantity magnetization is actually directly measured and not the extrinsic quantity moment. The frequency dependence of the line width for the same sample is shown here, along with a linear fit. The slope is directly proportional to the damping parameter alpha, and the y-intercept corresponds to the inhomogeneous broadening. This analysis clearly shows the importance of a broadband measurement, as a fixed frequency measurement would not allow one to determine the slope, nor y-intercept. The inhomogeneous broadening is generally used as a relative indicator of the lateral homogeneity of the measured film, where a smaller value is generally better. A final note, the nano software assumes a simple linear Gilbert damping contribution. There are other damping mechanisms that can be present, for example two magnon scattering, that are not linear and may require more advanced post-processing. On to installing the cryo fMR option hardware. Our family of PPMS systems represent a wide variety of form factors. Furthermore, the instrument box from Nanosk is not one of our usual CAN-based modules that you may be familiar with, which can make placement of the spectrometer sometimes challenging, especially since the included RF cables are only 36 inches long. That being said, the spectrometer can easily be mounted within a standard 19-inch rack, as shown here. Additionally, for the VersaLab, it can be simply placed at this location, or for the Dynacool, which will be shown in the following slides, the instrument can simply be placed at the top behind the sample chamber, as shown here. Let us now mount the sample to the coplanar waveguide. We find the best method is to simply tape the sample to the coplanar waveguide using Kapton tape, as shown here for the included 4mm by 4mm permaloid test sample. The indicated placement is ideal and slightly larger samples can of course be used. It is important to make sure not to cover these portions of the coplanar waveguide, however. This video will demonstrate installing the coplanar waveguide into the cryo fMR probe. Note, it is incredibly useful to use the P150 sample wiring test station to hold the cryo fMR probe in place so that it does not roll around on your desk or work surface. Also, just for completeness, here is the location of the calibrated Cernox thermometer. Gently insert the four alignment pins in the coplanar waveguide into the sample platform of the cryo fMR probe as shown. Once firmly in place, connect the two SMPM connections and then give all of the connections a double check. Note, depending on the vintage of your coplanar waveguides, there may be an additional adapter located here. To disconnect these SMPM connections, feel free to use the included tool, shown here, to gently pry the connections apart. With the coplanar waveguide in place, the cryo fMR probe can be installed within the PPMS, more specifically the Dynacool as I show here. Be careful not to catch the Helmholtz coils at the top of the sample chamber, as this can damage them. As with a standard measurement puck, Rotate the probe until the key engages and press down to fully engage the sample chamber wiring. Once in place, clamp the probe. Once installed, it is best to immediately purge and seal the sample chamber. Keep an eye on the sample chamber pressure to ensure that there are no leaks. Before connecting the cryo fMR probe to the instrument, it is best to perform a couple of simple DC continuity checks. First, the BNC connection, which applies current to the Helmholtz coil, is checked. The room temperature resistance should be on the order of 30 to 35 ohms. 
The most common failure here would be an open circuit, in which case the probe will have to be returned to quantum design for repair. Secondly, the center conductor of the RF circuit is checked for continuity and should have a resistance below 3 ohms. Note, if you have the cryo-FMR probe suitable for 40 GHz and therefore 2.92 mm K-type connections at the top, take note that these are very delicate and can be easily damaged if one presses too firmly with the multimeter leads. Again, the most common failure here would be an open circuit, which is probably just due to one of the SMPM connections breaking free, in which case the probe should be removed from the system and checked. The next step is to attach the two RF lines from RF in and out on the spectrometer to the cryo-FMR probe. Note, it does not matter which connection goes where on the probe. I personally just tighten these connections finger tight. It is important not to over tighten these SMA connections, and if you would like a more secure connection, please use the included SMA torque wrench. The final connection to the cryo FMR probe is the Helmholtz coil connection, which uses a standard BNC cable. Note the magnet and hall connections on the instrument front panel are not needed as the magnetic field control is handled by the PPMS and MultiView. We will discuss the inverse spin hall effect and auxiliary connections later. The reference BNC provides a reference clock to the modulation frequency if one wanted to interface with an external lock-in amplifier. As far as the back panel connections are concerned, ensure the power and USB connections are made. It is strongly recommended to connect the Nanos instrument to the same computer that is running MultiView. Finally, ensure the unit is switched on. Probe thermometry is handled by the standard 12-pin sample chamber wiring connections at the bottom of the PPMS sample chamber and the rotator MFP pass-through cable shown here. This end connects to the standard gray limo connection on the PPMS and this end to one of the ports listed here, which depends on the specific flavor of PPMS being used. The system is shipped with a configuration file that converts the Cernox sensor resistance into a temperature. How this configuration file is handled also depends on the PPMS and detailed instructions can be found in this document, which can always be found from the help menu in the Nanosk FMR software program. Moving on to software and data analysis. Note, if you purchase the cryo-FMR probe only and not the accompanying spectrometer, then the following discussion regarding software will not directly apply to you. As mentioned earlier, the measurement software is from Nanosk and the system ships with the latest version. That being said, the software is often updated and it is worth checking Pharos, our online digital database for the latest version. The system also ships with an instrument-specific configuration file. When starting the Nano software, it will ask for this data file, which will allow the software to communicate with the instrument and employ the proper calibration factors. As mentioned before, it is best if this software runs on the same computer running MultiView, and I actually prefer running the two programs side by side, as shown. It is important now to check the settings. The measurement type allows you to select between an in-plane, as shown here, or out-of-plane measurement. This will alter which form of the Cattell equation is being used for analysis. One can also select an inverse spin Hall effect measurement here. Single is also shown, which means that the software will attempt to fit a single resonance per scan. One can change this to dual in order to fit two resonances per scan. This could be useful in the study of multilayer samples or perpendicular standing spin wave modes, as will be discussed later. The signal processing parameters can generally be left as shown. Note the Cattell fitting and detector mode will automatically change based on the measurement type selected above. For most purposes, the default modulation frequency of 490 Hz is best. If this is changed from the default, the bandpass filter should be also disabled. Note, one can also choose here between a field swept measurement at a fixed frequency, which is the default and what will be described later in this webinar, and a frequency swept measurement at a fixed field. For a specific quantum design setting, select this box. Regarding communication with the Nanosk instrument, if connected to the same computer running MultiView, which is our recommendation, these do not have to be changed. 
It is very important, however, to ensure that you select the correct PPMS system here. Feel free to enter the magnetic field limits of your PPMS in this location. Note, if you mistakenly enter numbers that are too large, Multiview will not attempt to set a field larger than the system's actual maximum. The indicated field step size and settling time work well for all systems. The indicated field drive mode parameters are also recommended for all systems. I also recommend the indicated standby mode setting parameters. Note, for the Dynacool and Versalab, the magnet will always remain driven no matter what is selected here as there is no persistent option for those cryogen-free systems. However, for a conventional wet PPMS or an Evercool system, it is important to make sure that the system returns to a persistent state, preferably with zero magnetic field after the measurement has completed, to conserve helium. I will not discuss the magnetic field correction at length here, but basically this allows the software to partially correct for the remnant fields inherent to superconducting solenoids. Generally, the best practice is to first degauss the superconducting magnet first to reduce the remnant fields as much as possible. This can be done by simply oscillating the field to zero from about 2 tesla. As long as the subsequent measurements start at low frequencies and therefore small fields, the resulting field errors will remain small and one can confidently select no correction as shown. Finally, in the latest version of the Nano software, the ability to also enable temperature control of the PPMS via the sweep table has been included. The indicated parameters are generally good for most situations. Note, for the PPMS Evercool and Dynacool systems, the base temperature is 4 Kelvin due to the added heat load introduced by the cryo-FMR probe and necessary RF power. For the Versalab, the base temperature is 55 Kelvin. Once finished, click OK. The Sweep Setup tab will now be discussed and represents the portion of the software the experimenter will interact with most frequently. For those of you familiar with the standard PPMS measurement options, the sweep table essentially defines the measurement sequence, which will be measured from the top to the bottom. Up top, define where the data will be saved and the data file name. Next, the measurement parameters in the sweep table will be defined and discussed for a standard field swept measurement at a fixed frequency. Remember, frequency sweeps at a fixed field can also be performed, but will not be discussed at length here. The parameters shown are best for an initial course measurement of the included 10 nanometer thick permaloid test sample. The frequency input is obvious. Just take note that the minimum frequency is 2 GHz and the maximum is either 8, 18, or 40 GHz depending on the model of the spectrometer. The saturation field entry defines the initial field set point. Note, the start field can be the same or is typically a little bit lower than the saturation field. And of course, the stop field defines the field at which the measurement will end. The step size defines the space in between data points. No, one cannot truly sweep through the measurement fields. Each measurement of the microwave transmission must occur at a fixed field. Typically, the resonance line width increases as a function of field, and one can therefore often increase the step size to optimize the total measurement time. The input gain is an important parameter and defines the amount of amplification that occurs before the lock-in detection commences. Optimizing this gain can have a significant impact on the resulting signal-to-noise. Generally speaking, as the measurement frequency increases, so must the input gain to compensate for the unavoidable intrinsic microwave losses that will occur. At low frequencies, one must be careful not to saturate the response. A saturated response would exhibit clear clipping of the resonance peaks. If this occurs, simply decrease the input gain. The output gain sets the amplification after the lock-in detector and actually has minimal influence on the signal to noise. I generally keep this value fixed at 100. The modulation amplitude defines the size of the low frequency AC modulation field provided by the Helmholtz coils. This number can be increased to 0.45, which corresponds to a maximum modulation field peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of about 12 Ersted for the cryo-FMR probe. A larger modulation field generally results in better signal-to-noise. However, if your sample has a very narrow line width, then the modulation field can act to smear out or artificially broaden the measured response. Generally, one wants to keep the modulation field to be about 10% of the resonance line width. The FMR samples input defines the total number of individual measurements at a given field that will be averaged together to provide a single data point. And the FMR acquisition rate simply defines how quickly those measurements are acquired. The indicated default parameters are usually sufficient for most measurements. 
As it can sometimes be tedious to populate the sweep table, using the default parameters can be helpful to easily populate a given measurement parameter column. This sweep table represents an initial quick or coarse measurement over a relatively small number of frequencies. Later I will demonstrate how to more easily populate the sweep table based off of this initial coarse measurement. Once the sweep table is set, simply click the Start button to initiate the measurement. The software will automatically advance to the Measurement tab. Here we will run through a sample measurement at an accelerated pace. This window shows the measured I and Q channels. Remember, a lock-in technique is used for the measurement and therefore both the in-phase or I channel and out-of-phase quadrature or Q channel are simultaneously measured. It is also important to note that the phase is relative to the modulation field provided by the Helmholtz coil and in an absolute sense is not important for a subsequent analysis. As specified in the sweep table, 100 measurements are taken at a rate of 100 samples per second. Those 100 measurements for each I and Q channel is then averaged together and displayed to the right at the specified measurement field. Once a given field scan is completed, the resultant I and Q channels are combined and defined a particular resonance spectrum shown here. Instantaneous measurements as well as the estimated time for completion are shown here. During or after the measurement, one can proceed to the post-processing tab, as shown here. These values represent the fitted resonance field and line width for each frequency from the prior measurement. Depending on the coplanar waveguide used, one can choose either an in-plane, as shown here, or out-of-plane geometry. Furthermore, additional constraints upon the anisotropy field and gyromagnetic ratio can be selected here. For example, one can choose to fit these values or fix them to a particular number. The specific spectra used in the Cattell fitting can be cherry-picked, or one can simply choose to select all by using the Control-A keyboard shortcut. Once the spectra have been chosen, simply click the Process button to commence fitting. The resulting Cattell fit and linear fit to determine the Gilbert damping are then shown here. The extracted fit parameters of the effective magnetization, anisotropy field, damping, and gyromagnetic ratio are all then displayed here. The process data can be saved by choosing Save Process Data from the File menu bar. Back to the Sweep Setup tab. Populating the sweep table manually can be a bit tedious, especially if there are many frequencies or fields one wants to measure. There are a few tools in the software to make this process easier. Here I will discuss the Sweeps Config Cattell capabilities to populate the sweep table, which will bring up this window. By clicking the Fetch from Process Sweeps button, the results from our prior course measurement are entered here. Note, values can also be entered manually. The sweep table parameters can be entered here. For example, I would like to populate the sweep table spanning 2 to 40 GHz and measure every 2 GHz for a total of 19 sweeps. The software will automatically increase the step size of the field sweep according to the expected line width based on these parameters. The default parameters shown are often sufficient to capture the expected resonance curve and not waste too much time measuring the flat portions away from the resonance. Finally, to generate the sweep table, click Generate. To then add these values to the sweep table, click Add to Table. We now see that the sweep table has been populated. Note, you may find it useful to further modify some of the values here to further fine-tune the measurement for total time and signal to noise, perhaps the step size or the input gain. Let's now move on to some extensions to our FMR capabilities. We will start with measurements of the exchange stiffness via perpendicular standing spin waves. Here is a schematic cross-section of a relatively thick 100 nanometer film. For a traditional FMR mode, the phase of the oscillating moments through the thickness of the film is uniform, as shown here. This would represent a spin wave with an infinite wavelength, or a k-vector, of zero. Higher-order spin wave modes can also be excited in thin films with a finite k-vector. 
Here's a schematic first order perpendicular standing spin wave mode in which the phase of the oscillation differs by 180 degrees from the top of the film to the bottom. This results in a node at the film center. These higher order spin wave modes also manifest in a field or frequency sweep as an additional resonance. Here we see a standard field sweep measurement at 9 gigahertz of a permaloy silver alloy film. The resonance at high fields corresponds to the standard FMR mode and the resonance at lower fields to the first order PSSW mode. These resonances can be fit separately using the same equation discussed prior to find the resonance field and line width of each mode, which can be accomplished by the NANOS software by enabling dual fitting in the settings. Here is a complete measurement spanning 2 to 16 GHz showing the frequency dependence of the resonance fields for the FMR or P equals 0 mode and the first order PSSW or P equals 1 mode. Remember, as a function of field, the FMR mode will occur at a higher field. The FMR mode can be fit using the herring cattell equation to extract the gyromagnetic ratio and effective magnetization. Note, the herring cattell equation reduces to the standard Cattell equation for P equals 0. Once the gyromagnetic ratio and effective magnetization have been calculated using the FMR mode, the same equation can be used to fit the P equals 1 PSSW mode to extract the exchange stiffness A. Here is an example from the literature where this analysis was performed on permaloy alloy films to extract the damping, effective magnetization, and exchange stiffness as a function of the atomic percent of platinum, silver, or gold within the permaloy. Note, the frequency of the PSSW mode strongly depends on the film thickness. Thin films can have prohibitively high frequency PSSW modes which simply occur outside of the bandwidth of the spectrometer. Additionally, thin films are more challenging to measure as they often have a higher damping and simply less magnetic material to influence the transmission of the microwaves through the waveguide. That being said, films 50 to 100 nanometers in thickness are generally a good starting point when trying to observe PSSW modes and calculate the exchange stiffness. Moving on to the inverse spin hall effect. Let's start with a ferromagnetic film undergoing resonance at a given in-plane field and RF frequency. Now let's add a second non-magnetic layer, let's say copper. Via a process known as spin pumping, a diffusive flow of pure spin current will be pumped into the neighboring non-magnetic material from the ferromagnetic layer. In the case of copper, which is a very long spin diffusion length, not much will happen as the diffusive flow of angular momentum will remain unaltered at the interface. However, for materials which act as a good spin sink, for example palladium, platinum, and others, a portion of the spin angular momentum will instead be converted into a transverse charge current via a process known as the inverse spin hall effect, thus establishing a transverse electric field, as shown, and can be measured with a voltmeter. Interestingly, this spin to charge current conversion also acts as an additional damping mechanism, which tends to increase the measured line width of the induced resonance. Central to both of these equations is the effective spin mixing conductance, which characterizes the efficiency of spin transfer through the ferromagnet non-magnetic interface. As many factors can affect damping, it is generally best to use electrical measurements of the inverse spin hall effect voltage to measure this property. Making electrical contact to the edges or surface of the sample to measure the transverse voltage can be extremely difficult, especially since the surface of the sample must be in close proximity to the surface of the coplanar waveguide. To facilitate these measurements, a special coplanar waveguide for the cryo-FMR probe was developed, shown here which incorporates two electrical contact pads in close proximity to the central conductor of the coplanar waveguide. The sample can be simply taped firmly to the coplanar waveguide to ensure electrical contact. The electrical contacts are then integrated into the standard PPMS sample chamber wiring and connected to the inverse spin hall effect BNC connection on the front panel of the NANOS instrument box. Shown here are the conventional FMR in black and inverse spin hall effect in red response of a permaloy palladium bilayer sample. As the inverse spin hall effect voltage is measured using the same modulation scheme as the conventional FMR response, the curves will look very similar, exhibiting the now familiar derivative response. To quantitatively measure the spin mixing conductance, a quantitative measure of the inverse spin hall effect voltage must be carried out. 
To accomplish this, we recommend using an external nano voltmeter, for example, the Keithley 2182A. The voltmeter should have an analog voltage output, which is usually located at the back panel. This can then be directly connected to the auxiliary input on the Nanos instrument front panel. Here is a direct measure of the inverse spin Hall effect voltage, this time of a permalloy platinum sample measured at room temperature and 4 GHz. A quantitative measure of the spin mixing conductance also requires a quantitative measure of the microwave excitation field, which can be approximated with Ampere's law using the coplanar waveguide impedance, C0, central conductor width, W, and microwave power, P, as input parameters. Moving on to other platforms compatible with the spectrometers offered by NanoSC. Cryo-FMR measurements can be performed within the much smaller diameter sample chamber of the MPMS-3 by a special coplanar waveguides. Both in-plane and out-of-plane measurements are possible. Note for out-of-plane measurements, the maximum sample size is about 2 mm by 4 mm. A further restriction is in regards to inverse spin Hall effect measurements, which are not possible with the cryo-FMR probe available for the MPMS-3. Measurements can be performed over the same temperature range as that for the PPMS product line and up to 7 Tesla. Continuing on with cryo-FMR, the Montana Cryo Station can also perform FMR measurements for in and out of plane fields. The temperature range is 10 to 350 Kelvin at fields up to 7,000 Ersted. Also note, the cryo-FMR instrument can also be integrated into other magneto cryostats on the market. If you're interested, please contact your local quantum design office for more information. The phase FMR spectrometer is intended for room temperature applications which use an electromagnet, for example, the one shown here. While the NANOS instrument cannot energize an electromagnet, it can control a suitable voltage programmable magnet power supply, for example, those from KEPCO. In addition, the NANOS instrument incorporates a closed-loop Hall sensor to set the desired magnetic field. One stark benefit of a room temperature setup is the ability to easily set applied field angles between 0 and 90 degrees. Finally, a specialized inverse spin Hall effect coplanar waveguide also exists for the phase FMR product line. The latest development from NANOS includes a spectrometer with a 2 to 60 GHz bandwidth, which is currently in the final test stages. On to some resources. The two application notes shown here can be found on our applications page and contain much of what was presented in this webinar. Additionally, the testimonials page on the NANOS website keeps a running list of publications using the Cryo and Phase FMR systems. If you have any publications you'd like us to highlight, just let us know. As a final note, I would like to remind you of our digital online database, Pharos, which contains a wealth of detailed information regarding our measurement platforms and options. If you don't already have a Pharos account, current Quantum Design customers can sign up for one at the website indicated. If you have any further questions, do not hesitate to reach out. If you have any questions related to pricing, lead times, etc., then please forward your request to our sales department. If you have any questions related to hardware, repairs, or installations, this request is best sent to our service department. And finally, any questions related to measurements, sample preparation, research, and of course this webinar should be sent to our applications department. Thank you very much for your attention.